and Sarah and Mech hosting us for these sessions. And we're really excited that you all uh, took time out of your day on this Wednesday to join us uh, to dig in. So we do have 90 minutes scheduled. We hope you can stay for the whole time. If you can't, that is quite all right. Uh, so a little introduction first of, of myself and my business partner, Nan. If you don't know us, uh, my name's Chris Mall, and uh, I'm one half of the team here at Higher Education Licensure Pros. We created help uh, in reaction to the current uh, regulation requirements around professional occupational licensure disclosures that went into effect July 1st of 2020. And since that time, we've been supporting institutions of all types and sizes, including several right in Minnesota uh, with this compliance work. Prior to that, I worked for Capella University headquartered in Minneapolis, uh, and I was able to lead a small team there. And we were solely dedicated to professional and occupational licensure compliance. I know that most institutions do not have the resources uh, of that level or you know type uh, to do this. It's probably one of you who has been assigned this work in addition to the 27 other things that are on your list of responsibilities. So we hope that today can be, be helpful and provide you with some resources and support as you are figuring out how to implement these regulation changes related to professional occupational licensure. And I'm gonna let Nan introduce herself too before we get started here. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. So I met Chris when I, too, worked at Capella University from 2010 to 2020. I started out at Capella working across schools, helping them gain specialized accreditation, and then worked exclusively for the School of Counseling, providing operational support across all of their units, helping them to continue to meet quality assurance standards. So became familiar with faculty advising, data analysis, curriculum development, admissions, uh, those those uh, types of units. Prior to Capella, I worked at the University of Minnesota, primarily in the School of Social Work, and also gained my PhD from the U of M. Back to you, Chris. Great. So here's our agenda for our time together today. I'm going to first do an overview of what these federal Title IV regulations are. In particular, I'll be focusing on the new version that are, are going into effect this July 1st. Uh, also, we have a couple connections with current SARA policy, which I will point out along the way. And then we do have plenty of time dedicated for your questions today. So uh, in about 20, 25 minutes, uh, we'll have open floor for questions. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go. So as I'm doing the overview, you don't have to wait. You can put questions in the chat if you want. Um, and you can also, of course, ask them live uh, at, when we get to that question time frame here in about 20, 25 minutes. After we hopefully have been able to address uh, almost all or all of your questions, then we're going to shift gears into discussion. So we are hoping to have you know good uh, thirty ish minutes maybe for discussion at the end and really dig into how you're implementing these things at your institutions, what kind of challenges you're having, uh, maybe great successes that you want to share with the group would be helpful too. So the goal with this, again, is, is to give you an opportunity to talk to each other. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, we've been doing these for the other MEC region states, and I think there have been some great uh, connections and information sharing happening uh, between colleagues at the state level. So we hope that that can happen today too. Uh, also, we can talk a little about what we do with institutions, but that's not the focus. So feel free to ask questions if you have them. Otherwise, we're going to we're going to dig into the questions and discussion for most of our time. And before I get started with the summary, I uh, just wanted to make it clear that, you know, while I am an attorney and we are talking about regulations today, this is not legal advice. Uh, it is very important to have legal counsel at your institution or for your institution weighing in on some and many of these topics. Um, there are a lot of decisions to be made because there's flexibility provided around some areas in this regulation. And so it's important to, for you to have counsel around this. And I am not your counsel today. So I'll leave that at that. All right, so I'm going to start again with an overview, a summary of, of these regulations and what they do and what's required. So uh, when we talk about this, we like to break it down into three main responsibilities that institutions have. Uh, I'm not going to have the regulation language itself up on the slide here in the next few moments. We do provide that uh, in an appendix slide. And again, you'll have access to this deck after the presentation uh, later this week. So um, you can check that out there if you haven't seen it. 
but this is coming from regulation, what I'm talking about, and these live in the Title IV regulations, 34 CFR 668. Um, so these responsibilities, again, we break it down into three components. First, institutions have to understand how your programs meet the educational requirements for licensure. And this is where your institution's located, where your students are located, and also where you're recruiting or advertising for these licensure programs. And I'm gonna dig more into these details here in a moment. The second main responsibility, and this is the big new one that's coming online for this July 1st, is that institutions have to certify that your programs do meet the educational requirements where your institution is located and where your students are located. And then the third responsibility is communicating that understanding. Uh, this one is not new. So this communicating responsibility is the public disclosures and individual direct disclosures that have been in effect since July 1st of 2020. Uh, US Department of Ed did make some tweaks to these and I'll talk about those in a moment but the responsibility remains the same. You have an obligation to communicate if your programs meet the licensure requirements in other states and territories. All right, so I'm gonna dig into this understanding responsibility first. Uh, as I said, every institution that's participating in Title IV has an obligation to understand how their licensure programs meet the educational requirements uh, where in each state and territory where they're recruiting advertising, or most importantly, where you're enrolling students for these programs. So there's actually a lot packed into this first statement on the slide. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into each of this a little bit further here. So what do I mean by licensure program? Well, the first thing to note is licensure itself uh, is kind of an umbrella term in, in the, for these purposes. So it could be called something else like a certification, endorsement, authorization, registration, but essentially what it is, is something that's issued by a state or territory government entity, such as a licensing board or agency um, that's required for someone to work in that profession or occupation in that state or territory. So we're talking about things that are required, not something that's truly optional. And we're talking about things that are issued by a state or government entity, not a private organization so those are the key distinctions here. That's what we mean by licensure. I'm gonna use licensure as a shorthand all day. So, but remember it could be called something else in different states or for different types of professions or occupations. So what's a licensure program then? Well, wouldn't it be nice if we had a list that US Department of Ed or someone else has provided that gives us, here are the types of programs that are related to a license. Unfortunately, we don't have that. That's not how it works. Uh, it is up to each institution to determine which of your programs are licensure programs. So while we don't have a list from Department of Education, we do have some guardrails here or some guidance uh, for you to evaluate your programs. Uh, and really there's two components to this. First, has the program been designed to lead to a professional license or prepare someone for a professional or occupational license? And then, has it been advertised or is it being advertised as leading to some sort of professional license or to some sort of career outcome that would require a license in order to do that? So those are really the two things to look for when you're evaluating your programs. Has it been designed to prepare someone for a particular license or are you advertising it as leading to a license or to a uh, employment opportunity that would require a license. And then another thing I wanted to point out here is uh, this recruiting and advertising and enrolling. So the recruiting and advertising piece here, it does not come directly from the new regulations, rather it's coming from Department of Education staff uh, interpretation of the new regulations. So if, if you've heard one of our webinars in the past or someone else talk about this, um, there may not have been as much of a focus on recruiting and advertising. Uh, that's because myself and others have been getting information from Department of Education staff over the last several months around, you know, how are these things supposed to be implemented and, and what is the department's expectation around certain areas. So um, the main staff contact for U.S. Department of Ed, her name is Vanessa Gomez. Um, she's been pretty responsive to folks. You can email her yourself with questions. Uh, she takes that back to her team then 
and they uh, provide some sort of response. Typically takes a couple weeks, maybe a little longer, um, but they have been getting responses out, which is great. We're also expecting Department of Ed to release uh, some sort of frequently asked question or Q&A written documents uh, as guidance here in the near future. So um, I know some of you, uh, I know Kate was there and maybe others of you, we were at a conference a couple of weeks ago, uh, NASAPS out in South Carolina, there was a Department of Ed staff person who said, we're, rele we're releasing it soon, it's coming soon. Um, but when I looked this morning, it wasn't yet dropped. So <laughs> hopefully it will be out uh, at some point later this week or next week. But in that guidance document, uh, one thing that I know I'll be looking for and would encourage you to also is how they're talking about recruiting and advertising. Uh, so what we know, think is happening is it's really about recruiting for that particular licensure program or advertising that particular licensure program not necessarily a general advertisement for your institution, for example, or you know, generally recruiting um, activities for your institution. It's really more about that specific licensure program. So you would have to know in order to do specific advertising for a licensure program or recruiting activities that your program meets the educational requirements. All right, so that's what, all I'm gonna say about that for now. We can of course address questions if people have them. Uh, but I did also want to to kind of circle back here to say that these regulations apply to all of your licensure programs, all modes of delivery. Um, we've still been hearing some confusion. People think this is only a distance education program thing. It's not. It applies to all of your programs. And Department of Education, uh, again, staff have made that very clear uh, that these apply equally to all programs. There is a connection with distance education within the new PPA certification responsibility, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, final thing I wanted to note is, you know, this obligation to understand if your programs meet the educational requirements or do not meet. We kind of have this third category that's alive today, right? Uh, not determined or no determination made, which basically means you haven't tried, you haven't done the research, or maybe you have and you weren't able to come to a conclusion because you know there's not uh, enough clear information from that particular state licensing board. So this not determined understanding is okay today under the July 1, 2020 regulations, uh, but moving forward under these July 1st changes, again, because of the new certify responsibility, um, it's probably not gonna be okay for your institution to have uh, too many of these not determined or not uh, figured out states or territories. It's gonna depend on some factors uh, like where your students are located, number one. So again, you can only enroll where they're located, um, but just wanted to point that out. You may have a pretty lengthy list of states and territories where your institution has not determined. Again, that's okay under the 2020 version of the regs, but moving forward, you're probably gonna to need to make this list much shorter uh, and figure out if it does meet the educational requirements or not. All right, I'm gonna move then into this new big change for this July 1st. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a certified responsibility. Institutions need to certify through the program participation agreement um, that your licensure programs do meet the educational requirements where your institution is located and where your students are located at the time of initial enrollment in the program. Uh, what's the PPA? I did not know much about this uh, before these regulations came out because I've never worked in financial aid myself or been too close to this. Um, so if you're not familiar with it either, essentially it's the master contract that every institution needs to sign with the U.S. Department of Education in order to participate in Title IV federal financial aid programs. So there's someone at your institution, probably on your financial aid team, uh, that's very familiar with this. The PPA itself has been around for a long time. There's a pretty extensive list of things, those terms and conditions that your institution must agree to. What's new is that Department of Ed has added this new provision related to professional and occupational licensure. So starting this July 1st, for any new enrollments, anyone who's going to newly initially enroll in a licensure program on July 1st or after, you must be able to certify that your program meets the education requirements where your institution is located. That's pretty easy for most institutions. 
and the more challenging one where your students are located at the time of initial enrollment. Now for this, uh, there's an exception that Department of Education's created. If you have a, a student or applicant who's located somewhere where your program does not meet the educational requirements or you don't know, uh, you can still enroll them as long as they go through a written attestation process where um, they attest that you know they understand your program doesn't meet the educational requirements where they're located, but they actually plan to seek license and employment in a state where your program does meet the requirements. So that could be Minnesota, or it could be any other state or territory where you've identified that the program meets the educational requirements. And we can get into more details around that written attestation process if, if people have questions, and hopefully we can discuss that one a bit too as a group, if you wanna share about your plans for how you're gonna implement that. All right, and I see Nan's put um, some links in the chat. Thanks for keeping up with that, Nan. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out here is around student location. So uh, student location it has been important since July 1 of 2020 for these disclosures because it's connected to direct disclosures. But student location is even more important now with this new certify responsibility. And again, that's because you have to be able to say our program meets the educational requirements where that student or applicant or prospective student, whatever they are at the time, um, where they are located at the time of initial enrollment. So student location determinations or student location policy is not dictated by Department of Ed. It is left up to each institution to create your own student location policy that you will use for these purposes of determining your prospective student and student's location. Um, so if you're not familiar with your institution's student location policy, that'd be a good thing to uh, go find right away. Uh, see if you have one in place for these purposes. And if you don't, something that should be on your short list uh, to get you know working on very soon to have this in place because a lot of this flows from your student location policy, what that says, how it's treating different students, uh, and again, what your obligations then would be to them because of where they're located. So with the student location policy, we don't have, again, prescription here from Department of Ed, but we do have some guardrails. So you have to have a student location policy in place. Uh, it needs to be applied consistently across your institution, and it needs to be made available to Department of Ed should they ever ask for it. Um, there's also, again, kind of more through staff guidance, a sense that it needs to be a policy that is you know, regularly reviewed and updated, just like any of your other institutional policies. So very rough guardrails here, but that's what we have uh, for student location. And we have provided some examples of different institutions, student location policies and written attestations. Nan put that link in the chat. Uh, but just to make it clear, right, because these are individual decisions that each institution needs to make, there are a number of factors that go in to deciding you know, what your policy should be uh, or what that written attestation process is going to be. So these aren't cookie cutter templates, uh, but maybe a good starting point for you if you haven't seen one yet and are trying to figure out where to even get started. All right, I'm gonna move to this third responsibility then, which is communicating. As I mentioned before, this is not a new responsibility. This one's been around since July 1 of 2020. And Department of Ed has kept both types of disclosures under these uh, July 1 changes. So you need to have public disclosures, which is typ typically on an institution's website, and then individual direct disclosures. Typically, there's going to be email or electronic communications to your prospective students and students. For the public disclosures, we do have a change. Uh, Department of Education removed the obligation to disclose the states and territories where you've not determined anything about your program. So we know in working with institutions the past several years um, that many of you probably have a public disclosure right now for licensure programs where you say you meet Minnesota, maybe you've determined you meet a few other states in the region or elsewhere, uh, maybe you have a does not meet or a couple of those. And then probably a pretty long, long list of not determined um, states and territories. Again, for Title IV purposes, you know, that is in compliance with the current Title IV regulation around disclosures. 
But Department of Ed's removed that not determined categorization from um, the 2024 version of the regs. So you're no longer obligated to disclose those. What you are obligated to disclose are all of the states and territories where you determine that your program meets the educational requirements and those where you've determined that it does not meet the educational requirements. We know some institutions are gonna to plan to still have that not determined category up on their public disclosures. Uh, there's nothing that would prevent you from doing that. Uh, what would become a problem is if you still have a very lengthy list of not determined and you're recruiting or advertising in those places, or most certainly if you're enrolling students from those places uh, who are you know, not going through that written attestation exception process. So there may be instances where you still need to disclose all 59 US states and territories for some of your licensure programs. In particular, again, if you're engaging in advertising or recruiting activities for those programs in other states and territories. Uh, but for some programs, maybe your list will be shorter and you won't have all 59, which is a change because under the 2020, 2020 version, you did need to have all 59 states and territories listed up in your public disclosure. But because that not determines being removed, there could be you know, exceptions to that moving forward, depending on your program. I wanted to point out the connection to state authorization reciprocity agreement policy here. So CERA policy 5.2 uh, has been in effect for a while. It's actually uh, keyed to the 2020 version of these licensure disclosure regulations. Um, so I'm pointing it out though, because it's still effective and it still exists just to make sure people are aware of it. Uh, if you are, um, if you have not made a determination for your licensure program in any state and territory, and that's what you're disclosing on your public disclosures or your direct disclosures. Um, Sarah policy says that first, you should be making all reasonable efforts to make a determination. And if you still can't, you need to provide the board's contact information as part of that disclosure. So at, at a minimum, you know, directing them to a web link for that particular state board or agency um, and making that part of your disclosure. I do know that you know Sarah policy uh, is in the midst of their policy modification review process right now. Um, there have been some proposals put forth related to policy 5.2, uh, this licensure related um, section. And so we'll have to track that and see what happens. But the timing on that is Sarah policy changes will not be uh, announced or finalized before this July 1st. So this uh, current Sarah policy will remain in effect even after this Title IV you know, regulation change happens on July 1. All right, so finally, wanted to talk about the individual direct disclosures. Uh, Department of Ed has not changed anything about this section of the regulation for this July. So it's exactly the same language as we have currently under the 2020 version. Um, as I mentioned before, this one is connected to student location because your obligation is that you're sending a direct disclosure to a prospective student or applicant prior to initial enrollment in the program if they're located and it does not meet or are not determined state or territory. So this is my own side note here, but just thinking about how this will roll out starting this July 1st, anyone that you'll send a direct disclosure to after July 1 of this year will need to go through your written attestation process in order for you to enroll them, right? Because again, under the certify responsibility, you can only enroll if they're located in a meets state or territory, or if they complete the written attestation exception. So if you're sending a direct disclosure to a prospective student this July 1st or after, it means that they also need to complete your written attestation process. <clears throat> All right, finally for current students, again, no changes, which means you still have 14 calendar days to send them a direct notification if something has changed and they're located in a does not meet state. So this could be because the student moves, they change locations themselves, or something changes with the state's requirements and your program no longer meets, or something changes with your program's curriculum and you no longer meet a state or territory's requirements. You have 14 calendar days to notify all of your students that are now in this situation of being located in a does not meet state or territory. All right, I think we can move over, Nan, thank you.
So I did want to address uh, the electronic announcement that the Department of Ed put out a couple of weeks ago. Um, some of you may have saw this right when it came out, or maybe you've heard about it through uh, other groups or organizations. It is related to one section, the certify responsibility uh, for this July 1st. So basically what the department's doing is opening just a little crack in a window for some institutions that are not able to fully comply with this new certify responsibility by this July 1st, uh, that you could document all or any of the circumstances that you're experiencing that are preventing you from complying. Um, those should be unique. They should be uh, time specific and outside of the control of the institution. Um, if you're in some sort of scenario where you think this could apply to you, I definitely recommend that you consult with your counsel, uh, you know, to see what kind of documentation you're going to gather and have at the ready uh, in order to help defend an enforcement action should the department bring something uh, between July 1st and January 1st, 2025. And this um, electronic announcement does put that time frame in place. So the department's saying, you know, maybe we would let an institution have until January 1st to be fully compliant if we evaluate their circumstances and decide, you know, that it, it warrants this delay. Um, I wanted to say that this does not not delay the effective date of this regulation. So absolutely everything is still going uh, into effect this July 1st. It's just providing maybe a potential for some institutions to defend their uh, non-compliance between July 1st and January 1st. I also wanted to note, this is specific to the PPA certification uh, requirement. So this new certify responsibility, it does not apply to the disclosures that communicating responsibility. So you would need to still be complying there, uh, but around the certification piece, potentially some wiggle room. Again, really encourage you to, to seek counsel on this if you think that this might apply to your institution. All right. So uh, that's all I have as far as my overview presentation. And I know that was a lot I just threw at you. Um, so please, questions. I think we might have some in the chat. Um, Nan, thanks for helping field those. Sure, we do have some questions in the chat, Chris. And then people, please feel free to continue to either put them in the chat or raise your hand if you'd like to um, ask them yourself. First one, I'm just going to go from the top. Uh, question from Kevin relating to the term required. Some professions do have a license associated with them, but the license is not required to work, depending on the setting. For example, a residential treatment facility is opposed to private practice. Any guidance on that? There are often broad exem exemptions for practice based, based on the setting. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I know this has come up for a number of different types of programs. Uh, Engineering is one that I've heard quite a bit about, um, you know, even accounting uh, and others as well. So um, I've, I'm still struggling with this one personally, honestly. So I guess in my mind, I think that there probably are scenarios for any of these programs where you could say, well, someone could complete the program and still work in the field, even if they're not licensed. Um, I'm a good example of that. As somebody who completed a JD, you know, I don't need to be licensed um, to do the work that I've been doing uh, at an institution for a decade and then and now. So um, certainly there are options and opportunities for many of these programs, or most of them, I would think, where you could work uh, in some capacity in the field without holding the license. Um, it makes me a little bit nervous when we start, uh, when people start to go down that road. And the reason I say that is because, you know, if we take a step back and look at what the Department of Education's trying to do with these regulations is it's all around protecting the students and protecting uh, the taxpayers interest around student loans. So what they don't want to have happen is they don't want to have a student complete a program uh, graduate and, you know, be out there in the world seeking employment and not able to find it based on, you know, the, the program they completed. They want somebody to be employed in the field that's based on that degree program uh, and able to, of course, pay back their student loans at the end of the day is kind of the, the whole hook here. 
So while there are employment opportunities, I think if an institution is designed a program to lead to a license or to prepare someone for a licensing exam, um, and certainly if you're advertising it, so if you're, you know, in your program description, you, you mention a license or a licensed profession like CPA, for example, or uh, addictions counselor, whatever it is, um, then you're kind of steering the expectations of those students towards a license and towards licensed professions. So I'm, I'm not gonna give an answer, this isn't an answer I know and, and apologies for that, but just some things to think about and my thoughts on it. Um, again, this is probably an area, if, if you do have programs where you're trying to decide, is it really a licensure program or not? You know, we've designed it a certain way and we're advertising it, but there's other opportunities you know, I would say seek out counsel on this one as well. Um, certainly not something that you'd want to get wrong, especially on a big scale that could cause issues for you down the road. Thank you, Chris. A follow up from Kevin, and then we'll go into some questions on advertising. <clears throat> Two questions related to meeting educational requirements. One, how micro does this need to get? In other words, if the degree meets requirements, but what if a state has a particular course like an elective that needs to be taken? Yeah, so the answer to that, Kevin, is really dependent on what the exact state requirements are. There are times where you're gonna need to get very micro. So it's gonna depend on the type of license and the state or territory. Uh, but we know in our experience, it can even go down to the assignment level uh, for some of these license types where an institution or a student, a graduate would need to be able to demonstrate, you know, they've met a particular kind of subset of content and be able to show which of their assignments or which of their learning experiences uh, are satisfying that. That's, that's kind of an exception. That's pretty rare, but it does happen. The more common one is the class at the course or class level. Um, so there are license types for certain states where you would need to have someone who's very familiar with the curriculum, program director or faculty member, um, go in and match up your classes with what that state is requiring as far as content areas. Um, and you're right, like it could be an elective in your program. Other programs may have it as a required class, but it doesn't really matter how you get there as long as it's uh, part of the program or something that that your student has access to um, complete as part of that program. And then we can talk more about, about that curriculum comparison or program comparison piece if people want. But the answer is, yeah, it does get pretty micro sometimes. Uh, and if you need to do that, it's going to be dictated by the state's requirements really found in their regulations typically. Um, so their regulations will indicate if they accept, you know, a certain degree program, maybe that holds a specialized accreditation. If you have that, then they're not gonna look in detail at, at the classes themselves. They're gonna consider that the education requirements are met. Other times, maybe they uh, recognize or align with the specialized accreditation, but they still wanna see very specific classes on a transcript. So you would need to do that detailed comparison at that point. I'll just add <clears throat> that I have not seen states that provide an option for the courses they require, except for one. Uh, there's one case that I can recall that a state says, uh, the program needs to meet seven of these 10, for example, and list, list the course requirements. But for the most part, what I've read is the state has a list of required courses, if they do, that the program needs to meet. Here's number two on uh, Kevin's questions relating to meeting educational requirements. What if there are several licenses that the degree could lead to? Is it acceptable to, to determine that it meets at least one of those? Yeah, this is, this is a tough one, Kevin. So um, we don't have specific guidance in the regulation or in the commentary the Department of Ed released around this. Um, I'm not sure if we'll get anything out of this, you know, frequently asked question document that the department may release that could help address this. Um, but I would say, again, kind of, you need to be really cautious with this one. Uh, if you've designed the program to potentially meet more than one license type, 
Uh, and if you're advertising it as meeting more than one license type, then you would need to be able to certify that it meets those license types, I think, moving forward under these July 1 changes. Um, so wherever you have students enrolling from, you know, it could be looking at three or four different license types and making sure that your program meets uh, those educational requirements, which I know it can get very complicated. Um, and I'm wondering if this is maybe an uh, addictions or alcohol and drug related program, just kind of knowing how that works. It's one of the more complicated ones anyway, to start with, uh, but there are certainly multiple license types and credentials that are offered or required in a number of states related to those programs. Okay, let's move into uh, advertising. Jonathan asks, given the nature of digital marketing, should we assume that if we are advertising a licensure program online, that we have to investigate and list all states for these programs? Yeah, another great question. So again, the advertising piece um, right now, we just have staff communications with individual people. So um, I myself have received some emails, exchanged some emails with Ms. Gomez on this. I know others have as well. Um, I don't think anyone has gotten a specific answer from staff around like what that line is, right? So if we're talking about um, web presence or you know uh, online ads through various channels, through you know search engines or social media, what have you, um, we don't have an answer to that yet. But as I mentioned before, I do think that it it's probably going to be limited to advertising for that specific program, not more broadly advertising for the institution or even, you know, a school or college within the institution uh, or types of programs. It, it's about if you're advertising a specific licensure program in a particular state or territory. So hopefully more to come, more clarity to come on that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want institutions to go, you know, run to your marketing department and shut down a bunch of web stuff that you don't have to. Um, but I do think it's good to be aware that that there could be a need to restrict at least some of the states uh, where you're doing that work. And so finding out what that would look like now would probably be a useful piece of information to have, you know, what the capabilities are um, or not as far as restricting those web ads or presence in certain places. Okay, Kevin had a follow-up on advertising. I think Chris answered that. Kevin, if not, please let us know. So I'm gonna move on. Actually, um, a follow-up on a previous discussion uh, from Rebecca, and then we'll go to Heather. Just from Rebecca, just want to confirm, if a course meets a certain state requirement, but that course is an elective, and not required as part of the institution's degree program. The institution could state that the program meets requirements because the student has access to that course. Is that right? Yeah, so I guess I would wanna clarify, Rebecca, if it's a scenario where you know students are choosing from a list of electives that are, they're required to choose something from the list of electives for the program versus a course that just lives in another program or department somewhere that would be available to a student. Um, in my mind, that's kind of two different scenarios. So if it's a listed elective as an option that a student would need to take, um, I think as long as it's clear to that student that they need to choose that elective to meet a state's requirements, then an institution could say the program meets. But that's an important point is, you know, that student would need to know this is the elective I have to choose from this list in order to meet the state's requirements. Okay, Rebecca says, good points, thanks. Uh, let's talk about attestations. Heather asks, come July 1, if a student in a not determined state signs the attestation, how does that affect their ability to receive fi federal financial aid? So they would be eligible to enroll in your program if they complete a written attestation for you that says they want, want to or intend to actually seek a license in employment in a meet state, um, and they'd be able to access Title IV. So it, it's the same process for not determined as it would be for a does not meet situation. 
Okay, uh, that's it for questions currently in the chat. Please feel free to raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask yourself or, or put any other questions in the chat. Okay, I have one here. Uh, do these regulations apply to law school JD programs whose grads may seek licensure in other states? Yes, these regulations apply to any Title IV uh, participating institution. So uh, assuming that the JD program is, is part of an institution that participates in Title IV, this would apply. Anyone want to come online and ask a question? Or not. Put it in the chat. Sarah, you asked yesterday about uh, digital nomads, students who maybe don't have a home base. Let me ask Chris that one. Yeah, that's a great one to think through, right? Um, so I was talking earlier about the importance of student location policy. And this, it, the answer to this is why, you know, your student location policy, you should be considering things like if you're enrolling students uh, with international addresses who are outside of the US, maybe at the point of initial enrollment or beyond, right? Uh, if we're talking about a, a distance education program. Um, you should also think about other students who would be relocating for whatever reason, maybe sometimes out of their control, right? Like military affiliated students uh, who could be based somewhere when they uh, are thinking about enrolling in your program. And then if you've set your point of initial enrollment uh, a little bit later, like when classes start for that first term, um, you know, it's possible that you could have someone who's moved even or changed locations in the midst of that process. So thinking through these scenarios are really important. Um, whatever you key your student location determination to, whatever type of address it is, you know, uh, permanent address, mailing address, temporary address, address, for some programs, maybe they're going to be considered located in Minnesota if they are uh, going to physically be on your campus for a face-to-face -face type program. And it wouldn't matter as much where they're physically located at the time they're applying if you're going to connect your student location policy and initial enrollment date um, closer to that start of the term when they will be on your campus in Minnesota. So I just threw out a bunch about student location policy, but you really do need to think think about all those scenarios. And the digital nomad one is a good one because it's going to highlight, you know, depending on which address or which factors uh, you're connecting students' location to, it'll present some challenges for different populations. Chris, do you see we have a hand up? Oh, yeah, I yeah. see. Go ahead. Yep, great. Hi, I'm um, Raphael Hankin from Northwestern Science Health Sciences University. I have a question. We do have a lot of digital learners. And you brought up the issue of perhaps they're military and they're and uh, and they have to move around. Um, with the attestation, let's say they plan on once they get out of the service to practice and gain licensure in a specific state. Do they have to before enrollment attest? Okay, I want to be license in acupuncture uh, in Minnesota once I leave the service. How does that impact their taking the courses or applying for financial aid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks for the question, uh, Raphael. This, again, it's really going to depend on your student location policy and where you're treating these military-affiliated students at the time of initial enrollment. So we don't have a definition from Department of Ed on what point in time initial enrollment is. There's flexibility there for institutions to set that point in time. So what do you consider to be initial enrollment into the licensure program? Um, we know some institutions are doing that very close to the start of classes for a term. Others are doing it kind of way on the other end uh, around the application 
like a point in time when someone's applying for one of these programs, others are doing it around a point of admission to a program, and of course, lots of things in between there. But there are different considerations for choosing those different points in time, you know, and, and what the effects would be. Uh, so for your scenario, if you have a military affiliated student uh, that's located, uh, let's make this one easy, they're located in Minnesota at the time of initial enrollment into your program, uh, you don't need to get a written attestation from them, even though they could be moving around throughout the course of your program and changing locations, that's okay. Under these regulations, everything for the certify responsibility is connected to that point in time of initial enrollment. So if you have somebody who's considered located in Minnesota at the point of initial enrollment and they later change locations, you wouldn't need a written attestation from them you would have to provide a direct disclosure if they move to a does not meet uh, or not determined state. So that's kind of the one consideration there. If you have a military affiliated learner who's located in a does not meet or not determined state at the time of initial enrollment, you would need to secure written attestation from them in order to enroll. And that attestation could list Minnesota if that is their intention. They want to pursue a license and employment there after they're done, or it could list any other state or territory where you've determined the program meets. But unfortunately, what we know right now, again, this is from um, mostly from department staff, also a little bit in the commentary, it does need to list one specific state or territory. So I know this can be a challenge for military affiliated learners who often don't know where they're going to end up, right, in the next few years or five years, 10 years, whatever it is. Um, but again, as of right now, the department is saying it needs to list one specific state or ter US territory where the program meets the educational requirements. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, another question in the chat <clears throat> from Randy. Could you talk more about enforcement? In what ways will compliance be evaluated? Right. So, Randy, great question. You know, um, I think with any new regulation, it's not really clear what enforcement is going to look like until we start seeing some enforcement actions happening. Um, but I will point out, right, this is part of the Title IV regulations. This new certify responsibility is equal to any of the other terms and conditions that are listed in the PPA um, certification. So, Ultimately, any sort of penalty or enforcement action uh, would follow along with anything that your institution uh, would could potentially get dinged for around Title IV compliance or lack thereof. Um, so, you know, we expect that at some point in the future, after July 1st, uh, when your institution is going through an audit or some sort of Department of Ed review, um, potentially even with accreditation, I know before these regulation changes happened, we were hearing from institutions that their accreditors were starting to ask for information around licensure disclosures because they were aware of the you know, federal Title IV requirement and the accreditors wanted to ensure that their institutions and programs were following along with that. Um, so there's lots of potential avenues of who may be asking you to demonstrate compliance with these in the future. And then ultimately enforcement around you know, consequences or penalties, uh, it would kind of follow the same ladder of things that can happen related to any Title IV. You're probably not gonna go right away to losing Title IV eligibility, but that is kind of the top of the ladder, right? If an institution remains out of compliance, ultimately an institution could lose the eligibility to even participate in Title IV at all. Okay, we have a question on uh, listing the territories, which I'm starting to put into the chat. So I'll list those. And uh, let's see next, which accreditors, programmatic, HLC? Yeah, so we we heard actually both um, from institutions that some programmatic accreditors and then, um, yeah, it actually would have been HLC thinking about the region that the institution's in. Great follow-up question there. That's it for questions in the chat. Uh, we have 
few more minutes that we set aside for questions. Anyone else want to raise your hand and get off mute and ask directly or put it in the chat? As I'm writing out these territories, <laughs> I don't think either Chris or I knew that there were all of these on here. As a matter of fact, Daryl, as an attendee, helped us identify these uh, in regulation. So I'm writing them out. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Well, if we don't have any other questions, uh, we can shift gears, but maybe I need to give Nan a minute. She's still typing. Uh, what we wanted to do next before we start discussion is uh, have you all answer a poll question if you're willing. So uh, if you haven't used Slido.com before, um, you can either go to their website, Slido.com, and then punch in those numbers, 2561206, or you can scan the QR code up on your screen with your mobile device and that'll take you right to the poll question as well. So we're asking you to answer, you know, what is your biggest or greatest challenge with implementing these regulations? And in just a minute here, we'll uh, present the link so you'll be able to see the live responses coming in in real time and we'll see what the largest or biggest challenge is for the group collectively. All right, you want to present the link, man? We'll see what answers, responses we've got coming in here. All right, so uh, looks like the winner so far anyway is comparing your institution's programs to the state and territory requirements. Definitely time consuming. Uh, we already had some questions and comments about that, right? That micro level detail comparison um, can be a challenge for sure. Researching educational requirements in other states, also a challenge, very time consuming work, uh, requires a certain level of expertise to do it because you're gonna need to look at state law and regulations, uh, you know, find information on boards, websites, um, takes quite a bit of time to find that and understand it and be able to digest it and make it available to everyone at the institution who needs it. Some of you are just getting started on this work. So thanks for being here today. Hopefully this will provide some helpful starting places. Um, and then we've got a few other responses. Glad to see that, that most of you are feeling supported by your leadership. So um, I know that can be a real challenge if you don't have that support because this work does take a lot of people <laughs> to make happen, right? It's a team effort for sure. Um, one person might be charged as responsible for it or you know, running point on it, but uh, certainly one person cannot do all of this work alone uh, for any institution, it definitely requires collaboration with others. Karen, I see a hand up, go ahead. Maybe an accidental hand, but if you wanted to share something, Karen, you have the floor. Okay, accident, no problem. Great, all right. Well, we wanted to shift gears then into some discussion. So as I mentioned uh, before, we're really hoping that you all are willing to share uh, with each other and um, we'll talk through some of this stuff. So on this next slide here, we have some discussion questions. Um, first ones I kind of grouped around this research and program comparison, knowing that it is a challenge. Again, we've been meeting with other states. Um, those two are usually pretty close to the top, just as they were for you all as one of the biggest challenges. So is anyone willing to share how you're tackling that research for other states at your institution, what your process looks like, um, things that you've learned along the way and maybe changed, anything you want to share?
I won't call on people because I'm not that cruel, but it would be great if anyone's willing to share anything about how you're uh, handling research for your institution, even who's doing it. You know, if you're having um, staff do it, are you doing it yourself? Do you have your faculty or, you know, program directors do it? Um, if anyone's willing to share it, I know it'd be helpful, especially to those people who are just getting started, right? Uh, trying to figure out how to do this. All right, I'll break the silence, Chris. Yay! <laughs> so um, my name is Tanya Bach. I'm at the University of St. Thomas. And um, I will say that the um, we are having, so my office is coordinating and facilitating. Um, we are working in terms of researching educational requirements in other states. We work um, with the program directors and the faculty who have the expertise to do that. We have found, though, very differing um, reactions and stances that um, faculty and disciplinary leaders have taken. For example, um, one, the faculty are willing to do it, but they've really struggled with resources, just like what was indicated. Um, and so we um, have tried to connect them with one of our librarians um, in, in our law school to help them with that. And that seemed to have been, and this was actually before your, um, um, excellent help to Chris and Nan, by the way, um, with, uh, inform with how we've been working with you too. Um, but that's, that's kind of one strategy we've done. Um, but we have, um, another, um, group that, uh, another faculty group and, and staff group that just say that they don't have the resources and we need to work with them to really struggle. So it is, I can attest to what everyone was saying. Um, and we were trying to have a tailored approach as much as possible with the faculty and the program directors that we're working with. Great, thank you so much, Tanya, for sharing that. Just like all of you have this issue, right? Along with 27 others every day to deal with. I know it, it, it's definitely a challenge for faculty or program directors too to fit in this, which is a brand new thing, uh, you know, or was a brand new thing uh, in 2020 anyway. But it, yeah, it, it's a challenge um, just because of limited time to do it. And it does take time. So yeah, I would agree with what Tanya said. I'm Heather Nickel from St. Mary's uh, University of Minnesota. And um, some faculty are really on board and program directors. We did find that any of our health programs uh, the for the states, those standards for the most part are pretty spelled out pretty pretty well. Um, we are struggling a little bit with our education programs as they just tend to be all over the place with the states. Um, so, but um, but we're just working with the program directors just to go through through all the ones, and you know, we're 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 getting toward the end of going through it, so we're super excited. Great. Well, congratulations on that milestone, Heather. <laughs> That's impressive, you know, to get towards the end of that list, I'm sure it feels really good. Great. I could have... share a little bit about our process, too. Um, I'm JC O'Connor at Concordia College. Um, so we had designated someone in my office to sort of take the lead. And the person who was doing that was a um, a former member of the academic affairs um, staff. In fact, he was the former vice president for academic affairs, um, but he was just doing some work in our office. And so he knew the faculty really well and was able to work well with them as we were doing sort of our initial evaluation um, of our licensure programs. Um, but since then he has left and so, um, I feel like having someone designated was really helpful. And now that he's left, I feel like I, someone else has been designated, but I'm just not sure that they're um, really taking the lead. So I, my advice, I guess, would be if you're able to designate someone who, who has the time to at least be the lead, that what worked really well for us when, when we had that. Um, and now I'm just feeling like we really need to find who that next person is going to be. Um, because like the others have spoken, 
you know, we have some faculty who are on board and we're doing all of this kind of on their own anyway, like our nursing faculty um, and then others that, you know, just, just claimed, um, I, and I use the word claim, but, you know, like they claim they don't have the time. None of us have the time. <laughs> so I'm not just diminishing their um, their concern about that because it's very time consuming. But um, so having someone who can work with the faculty and help them, um, you know, move it along where we needed and having some of designated seems to be the approach that we're going to have to take to make sure that someone's paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jazzy. That's, um, that's good to think about, again, especially if you're just getting started in this or trying to uh, kind of <laughs> jumpstart the efforts maybe that have been, you know, going on for a while. Uh, if you can have somebody who has this right as one of their 27 things, um, but that maybe most importantly has some sort of connection or relationships already with uh, the faculty or, or program directors or key people who will be engaged in this research and program comparison work. I think that's what I took away from your comments is, you know, that relationship piece shouldn't be underestimated um, like most things in the world, you know, you often can get more done if you have a good relationship <laughs> with the person that you're asking to do it. So really important to think about. Anyone else wanna share about your research process or that even the program comparison, the curriculum comparison piece? And then more specifically, I'm really curious around uh, documentation. If any of you have set up uh, a new kind of process or you know, repository where you're storing documentation related to this research and those uh, comparisons and the meets or does not meet determinations that are being made. I can talk from ignorance. I find that usually helps. Um, we, we have a spreadsheet at Bethel University set up for each program that has licensure for each state and territory that then um, actually is tied to the website. So the website can pull from the spreadsheet to populate whether we meet or we don't know, or it doesn't meet. So we've had to set that up with the web team and that um, I don't know exactly how it works, but it is a, a, a basic structure. It's not very elegant. It's a basic structure that allows for loading into the website the information that we have available to us and it's then reviewed by program directors theoretically uh, to ensure that it's as accurate as we can make it great thanks for sharing that randy i think that's an important consideration too like how are you connecting you know these determinations to your disclosures so whether it's your public disclosures on your website or those direct disclosures that are being sending out sent out to uh, prospective students or applicants and current students. And if you can find some sort of more automated way to do that, uh, you know, probably going to work better in the long run, but can take some time on the front end to get set up IT resources and other things to make that happen. So um, thanks for that. Good, again, again, good things to think through, especially if you're just getting started in this work, thinking about what you're needs might be um, in addition to the research and program comparison work, other resources uh, definitely would be needed to bring all this together and, and get those disclosures up and, and be able to make uh, those certifying statements as part of your PPA when the time comes. There's a request on chat. Randy, would you be willing to share that link? Oh, you answered. <laughs> you answered already. Okay. And then we have a um, few others in the chat. Uh, Kevin asked, uh, one frustration has been in our field counseling. Licensing boards do not typically approve programs, only applicants. Even programmatic accreditation, which they have, may not be sufficient to guarantee licensure. Interested mm -hmm. in any thoughts on how to accomplish that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin, brought, you bring up a great point, um, which is actually way more universally true, not just for counseling programs, but uh, in our experience, there are very few licensing boards or agencies that will review and approve out-of-state programs. 
So rather what happens, as you described, Kevin, is someone completes a program, they apply for a license, and then that out-of-state licensing board or agency you know, looks at their transcript and, and all the other documentation provided and decides if that program from out of state meets the educational requirements or not. Um, so there's not, not really opportunities or mechanisms, even if you wanted to try to seek approval from these you know, other state and territory boards that just doesn't exist right now as an opportunity. So the Department of Education, again, has squarely put this responsibility on institutions that you need to know what the requirements are in other states and compare your programs and decide if it meets or doesn't meet. Um, but that practically just doesn't mesh well with you know how it works in the real world because these licensing boards and agencies do it on an applicant by applicant basis at the time that someone's applying for the license uh, for the most part. So you know, you have to do the best you can do. So institutions need to have a reasonable, defensible process in place for figuring out what the other state requirements are and comparing your program and making a decision. So um, the more that you can document around what your processes are and how those decisions are being made uh, will only benefit an institution in the future, especially if you do have some sort of audit or enforcement action or inquiry from Department of Ed or an accreditor or anyone else. Um, but that obviously takes time too, to, you know, to document uh, and have those things at the ready should you need them. So, uh, and at, at a minimum, what we're encouraging institutions to do is, you know, it, it's definitely great to have spreadsheets. I think this work just lends itself to spreadsheets um, where you're going to want to have whoever's making that decision, if it meets or not, uh, put some clear notes or notations in. If it's based on a specialized accreditation, you know, note that somewhere in your documentation, your master spreadsheet for that program type. If it's based on comparing the courses, you know, have it really spelled out in black and white. Here's the state's content area. Here's our course that meets it. And here's the next one. Um, and have notes around who was doing that work and when uh, you know, so that it's clear that you're basing it on this version of your catalog or, you know, these courses at the time uh, and have that, again, clearly documented, I think we'll, we'll do a lot moving forward. And that's really the best that an institution can do because you're not able to seek that external approval from out-of-state licensing boards for the most part. That's just not a possibility. Another message uh, in the chat, question in the chat regarding student location. What if a student takes in-person courses during their first semester? Are they still bound by the distance education requirements? Yeah, so um, we haven't really gotten into that distance education <laughs> definition um, yet, I don't think here today. So the new PPA certification regulation, the language from the regulation itself uh, list or indicates that you need to be able to certify that your program meets the educational requirements where the institution is located and where your distance education students are located. Um, the reason that I don't highlight that when I when we're talking about those three responsibilities is because of the definition that the U.S. Department of Education is applying to distance education. So they're using a definition uh, from the May 2023 Dear Colleague letter that they put out, which is focused on accreditation and distance education. And in that letter, it says if a student is taking one or more class online, then they're considered a distance education student. And this has further been kind of clarified by staff that what they really mean is if they're taking one or more class online during that first term of enrollment in the licensure program, then that meets you know, their definition of distance education within this regulation. So I say all that because uh, you'll notice, you know, I've, I've just been saying students more broadly, and that's because of this connection with your student location policy. So it is absolutely crucial that you consider how you're treating you know, different types of students uh, for different uh, modalities of programs and, and how that all fits in with your student location policy 
which again, each institution gets to set um, for your students and for your programs. So uh, I think back to the original question, if, if a student is not, I think the question was if a student is not taking any online classes, so they're coming onto your campus for classes, face-to-face -face classes during the first term of enrollment, like where would they be located or what do we need to do? No well, online courses the first semester. Right. So they're, they're located wherever your student location policy says they're located at the time of initial enrollment. Right. So if you have a student who uh, already resides in Minnesota and they're going to be relocating to your campus to do a you know traditional kind of face to face campus based program, I would think most location policies would consider that student as Minnesota. There doesn't really seem to be many other options. But if you have somebody who's currently in Illinois, right, they graduate high school from Illinois and they're going to move to your campus, um, your student location policy could treat that person differently depending on what the policy is so if you're connecting it to like the address that they provide at the time of application to the program for that illinois student it could be illinois which means you would need to be able to certify that you meet the educational requirements in illinois or they would have to do a written attestation um, in order to enroll in your program since you can only enroll from meet states Hopefully that helps, but the, it is important to think through these different populations of students for your different types of programs and how your student location policy will be applied to each of those so that you understand, you know, what your obligations will be around um, certifying and then the communicating uh, for direct disclosures. Heather, did you have a follow up? No, and I don't know if it's helpful to clarify. I was thinking of um, an in-person residency, so not that students would come to campus for the entire semester and then switch to distance, but that they would come to campus um, for a shorter period of time and whether that would make them not a distance student, but I think you answered that question. Yeah, I, again, I'm like a broken record, I feel like, on these things, but it's always going to come down to your student location policy and how you're treating those students. Um, and, you know, some institutions are putting quite a bit of detail into these policies. So very explicitly saying, you know, um, how they're going to treat students for these different kind of programs, like a campus based face to face versus and online uh, international students, people are putting in considerations for those or people with you know, an address outside of the US when they are initially enrolled, um, military. Like, so there are, you can make these policies as robust as you want to, if that's helpful for your institution you know, while you're thinking through these things, or you can have a policy and then separately have your documentation on how you're gonna be applying that policy to these different scenarios and different um, groups of students. Does anybody want to share, since we're, we're jumped in here to student location policy, uh, if you've been working to update your policy in light of these July 1 changes, anyone willing to share kind of the things that you've been thinking through or updates that you're planning to make? Chris, you are so good at waiting. <laughs> Maybe annoyingly so. <laughs> yeah, again, I won't call on people because I'm I'm not uh, that cruel. But um, please, if you have anything you want to share, I guess I'll throw out this other question related to that. So initial enrollment, do you have or do you know what your uh, definition of initial enrollment is at your institution? What What is that point in time? 
as I mentioned before, there is some flexibility around that. Um, so institutions are approaching, the, approaching that in different ways. What point in time is initial enrollment? All right, Chris, I'll break the silence again. This is Tanya Yay. from Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Tanya. <laughs> um, I'll say that we're still working on this initial enrollment, but where we're um, where we're going, where we where we're headed with this right now, but we're still discussing this with our our academic units that this is relevant to, is we're going to have to um, have different definitions for initial enrollment for undergraduate versus graduate. So on the undergraduate side. Initial enrollment would be the first term in which they declare their undergraduate major that has licensure embedded within that major um, versus on the graduate side, initial enrollment would be the first term in which they're enrolled in that program that has licensure. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's an important distinction because the undergrad students for us will be at St. Thomas because they come undeclared. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and then we'll make that major declaration versus the graduate students who come right into the program. So mm -hmm. our currently our location policy and, and how we're kind of defining these things and um, is not that. So we're having to make some revisions to it, which is going to take some time. But that, that's where we're at with it right now. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tanya. And yeah, exactly. Right. You need to think about um, your student populations, your programs, how things work at your institution and figure out what makes sense. Um, and I think it absolutely can be that you have different definitions or things happening for graduate versus undergraduate. Um, we saw Department of Ed like give a nod to that in the commentary that they released with the 2020 version of these. Um, their, their point is that you just have to have a student location policy in place that you're applying consistently. It doesn't mean you have to have the same criteria for you know every single um, for graduate versus undergraduate as an example, or your you know face-to-face -face programs versus fully online, whatever those distinctions are. So, thanks for sharing that. Well, we we are. Um, almost rounding up to the top of the hour here, but I'll try one more question. So um, any of you wanna talk through the uh, written attestation process uh, and also related to that, you know, are you creating or updating your enrollment or admissions processes so that you have some sort of hard stop that will be in your system uh, for applicants or uh, for, you know, again, program admission related to the written attestation. So do you have something in place where you're going to be able to know for sure that someone is in a meet state or territory at the time that they're initially enrolled? And if they're not, are you going to have a way for your system to identify those other students and then connect that to your written attestation process? That's a lot to, to chew on. So I, I might have just um, given some of you a panic attack if you <laughs> haven't gone down that road yet on what, what all of this implementation actually entails. Hi, Chris. I'll jump in here. My name is Senega Anzenge. I'm from the University of Minnesota um, out of the provost's office. And 
at the U, everything is so decentralized that when it comes to so many things, um, the responsibility for so many things are, are kind of taken up at the collegiate level. But then we might have some undergirding like system-wide policy, sometimes small P, sometimes big P, to kind of guide who does what or how those things get done because ultimately they need to get reported to somebody who needs to make the institutional reports or whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. So with that then to some of the, the, the questions about like how we define enrollment, essentially it's kind of the point at, at which money exchanges hands, if you will, to put it rather crassly, mm -hmm. right? So a student is officially kind of enrolled once they've essentially kind of paid to enroll in a program in a college. Um, so that is our that is our defendable position of enrollment. Then at that point also is when we capture student location. So again, that is the defendable position the institution has taken on student in case, student location and enrollment. Now I'm using that language very intentionally because with NC Sarah and all these other you know bodies that you just you need to establish a defensible position, right? So. Mm -hmm. And that's why I use that language that way. Um, ah, so then when students are enrolled in programs that lead to licensure, every um, every kind of, um, it's at the point of enrollment that triggers then a, a, a disclosure, if you will, an automatic disclosure to that student of whether the program meets, does not meet, or at this point still, it's undetermined whether the, the program will meet, you know, licensure requirements in an area, depending on where they're coming from. Now, it comes, this, this, this individual disclosure is sent to students, again, at the point of enrollment, every, at every, it's not every term, but it's for every new, every new enrollment in an academic cycle, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so like if you didn't enroll in the fall, but you enrolled, enrolled in the spring, that's what it's going to trigger that, you know, that notification being sent out to you. And it's going to pop up on your screen and you can't do anything until you click that you've acknowledged that you, mm -hmm. you've, you've at least seen that. Right. And then that's mm -hmm. also captured that. OK, that was sent to you, Chris. You clicked that it was. And we've had that in place since 2020 um, to kind of cover ourselves in the case that we should need to collect something like this. Now, we haven't gone and uh, refined that process to make it an explicit attestation. Um, frankly, I've been just tracking the conversation to, to figure out what I need to go back and tell my folks we need to modify and what we've been doing. Um, our process also initially started primarily focused on our online and distance programs to kind of get buy-in that way and then um, proliferated out over the past several years to our to, to all programs. Now that said, we do a lot of notification. We do a lot of these different. Um, we have a lot of these different steps or, or things that we have implemented. But something that I've been really chiming the the alarm about is that we don't necessarily have an internal compliance process for all of these things. So we do these things. And I could show you that some of these things have been done. I could show you that most of these things have been done, but do I have a process that collects all of these things? Um, not really, and by the end of this year, I will. <laughs> like that's that's mm -hmm. been the, the thing that I've been really working on now is to emphasize that more than just things, we need to have it be very systematic and very almost pro, pro, procedural in a way that we capture that so that at any point, we can demonstrate that this is what we're doing. But then also this ties into so many other things that we're seeing come up in a lot of different places. FVTGE for folks who are, you know, tracking different conversations as far as like, yeah, you know, fair value uh, transparency, um, like all of these, and then just programmatic and institutional accreditation when it comes to a lot of just student contact hours and just, not, just a lot of different things that are coming out of different regulatory spaces that touch all these things. We're, we're pulling the strings together too, um, to try to make a sense effort to address so many of these different things, kind of not in one swoop, but as best of an effort as we can. Yeah. Uh, I know I just tied up the air for a lot, but that's kind of, those are the things that, that, that we've been trying to pull together across the University of Minnesota system.
over the past, not just six months, but really past several years as the different um, kind of uh, regulatory pieces have come out and developed over time. Yeah, absolutely. That's exciting. Uh, and yes, I can understand why it's a year's long undertaking, you know, to try to get to that point. Um, but definitely will be be great to see that what that systematic process, you know, really entails when you guys are all done with it. And I'd encourage you if, if you're willing in the future to share that, you know, through presentations, and conferences or whatever. Um, I know that there's an appetite from institutions of all types on, you know, how to learn from each other as you're doing this work. So thank you for that. And if I'm being completely honest, because it has been like an intentional piecemeal effort, that's part of why we haven't, you know, I haven't been out trying to circulate it in more places. It's starting to take shape in a way that that can be done more intentionally. But to this point, it's just been kind of more responsive than you know, I'm being in front of. Yep. Yep. Get it for sure. Great. Well, thank you. I'm uh, noticing we're almost at the top of the hour. So we do have one final kind of poll question uh, to wrap this up for today. If you would all be willing. Um, if you go back to Slido, so you can go to the website, slido.com, or if you go to uh, the QR code. Sorry, I got to flip something over here. I always forget to do this. Nan and, and Sarah are probably laughing because <laughs> again, we've done this for multiple states and I always forget that I gotta go flip this on Slido. Okay, so we're ready. The new the new poll should be up and available for you all to take if you would like to. So um, go ahead and scan the QR code or go to slido.com and then we'll put the results up here as we close out. You want to go ahead and share, Nan, and then I think um, Sarah, you usually close us out. So whenever you're ready to do that, no rush. But I know we're almost out of time officially. We are. Uh, again, thank you all so much for joining us this morning. And and something that is is a heavy subject to talk about. Uh, there's so many intricacies. Um, Again, a special thanks to Chris and Nan uh, for, for holding these um, and all of the other things that they do for us uh, regarding uh, professional licensure and many other things. So again, as a reminder, this session has been recorded and um, will be available uh, shortly. And once that is, uh, a link will go out with the uh, link to the recording as well as a copy of the slide. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful Wednesday. Bye-bye. <laughs>